Okay. Um, please give a warm welcome to our speakers from Access Now. I'll give the floor to you then. Thank you so much. Testing, testing. Yeah, perfect. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, maybe before we kick off our you know, formal presentation, I just want to give you a sense of who we are so we can do very, very brief introductions. Hello, my name is Raman, Raman Jeet Singh Chima. I'm Senior International Counsel and Asia Pacific Director for Policy and Advocacy at Access Now. I'm ordinarily based in New Delhi. Hi, everyone. I'm Namrata um, from the Asia Pacific team at Access Now, also from India. Very nice to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Dodora. I'm the US Policy and Advocacy Manager for Access Now, and I'm based in New York. It's my first time in Asia, and uh, I'm having a great time and really happy to be here today. Thank you. I can uh, kick off and continue a bit. And it's uh, definitely not my first time in Taiwan, but I'm so grateful to be here, and in particular to be here with the Gulf Zero community. Because in many ways, the story of Access Now mirrors a sto the story and experiences that so many of you have, but even the Gulf Zero community has. We are an organization that is actually born from protests, and an organization that recognizes you need to exist, you need to collaborate in order to be able to sometimes prevent, you know, not just bad things from happening, but pretty sometimes in challenging a bad present. Uh, we're a comparatively young organization, just about uh, born in uh, 2009. Many of us have joined after that. Since the clicker is not working, I am going to stand and do that then. Okay. We are now slightly larger. We, when I joined the organization in 2015, we were around 35 people totally, and our advocacy and policy team, the team that looks at what do governments do on issues of digital rights, was just about seven people. I think I was the seventh hire. We're now 130 people. We're based in 14 locations across the world. And we don't put this out because we want to boast or note how much we've grown, but just to recognize the nature of how the problem has itself expanded. The internet and digital rights are no longer an outlier issue. It's not a specialist matter. It's a matter that impacts the everyday of every single person, not just in this room, but of our families, our communities, our networks. Our mission, and we really hold this dear, is to be able to defend and extend the digital rights of communities at risk and focusing particularly on also the human rights of individuals. We see ourselves as a human rights organization focusing on advancing digital rights in particular. We operate in a model of being grassroots to global, which means that we try to advance and protect what domestic actors, regional institutions, and others are doing. And we see ourselves as a mix. We were born in 2009 trying to provide digital security. We were trying to help activists, particularly during the Iranian Green Revolution protests, be able to secure their devices, be able to collaborate, be able to work together. because. The internet empowers, but also the internet puts you at risk. The same tools that protesters and activists are using to share information can also be used as a way to compromise and make them vulnerable. And we soon realized that you need to provide digital security not just in authoritarian contexts, but globally. And you also need to engage on the issues shaping how surveillance technologies, how digital security, and how our devices and the internet itself work. You can't just provide technical security. You need to campaign. You need to be an activist. And I think. One reason why I particularly value always being here in Gov Zero events is that the Gov Zero community is not ashamed. You are activists, you are creators, you are builders of things. What we try to do is mix all of this together in terms of how we operate for work. We operate on a range of issues, and this gives you a sense of what we do here. And the reason, again, why these issues grew, I was looking at a, we had a version of this presentation that was from 2019, and we had five issue areas there. And the reason why this has grown is because the internet has essentially consumed every part of human society. Technology impacts everything, and the issues that impact human rights have grown. Whether it's more classic issues such as business and human rights, what are the human rights implications of tech companies, to issues of uh, artificial intelligence, which is more recent, to topics such as internet shutdowns that people in Taiwan may be less always familiar with, although perhaps more increasingly so recently, to many other areas of work. 
the the core of access now as i mentioned is our digital security helpline it works 24 by 7 today as we speak there's a there's security incident handlers responding to requests from activists civil society journalists globally on very basic things from how can they set up an encrypted messaging platform? How can they use uh, secure uh, file hosting services to more complicated questions around, I work on X issue and organized crime is trying to hack my device, or I'm working on this sensitive topic, how do I secure this network of activists who are working across four and five countries? Our helpline does this for free, working 24 by seven, and it doesn't do this by itself. It works with many other groups, including, and we're very you know, happy to also often collaborate with people from East Asia and elsewhere in providing assistance in terms of reactive digital security, proactive education and training on digital security, as well as threat analysis and, and more sophisticated malware analysis. Our grants team tries to help grow the digital rights community globally. It's not just about us, it's not just about the partners we work with, it's about the next set of actors that are there. As someone mentioned in a previous session, it's not just about the people you may see on stage, it's the next set of people who will join the stage. We hope not to be here in a few years, we hope to see other faces here, and that's possible only if we and other organizations provide more funding, more support, particularly in the majority world, what people sometimes call the Global South. The Keep It On campaign is something that's more, we're more well known for, and you know, we'd pivot and speak to. It, sh it speaks to how do internet shutdowns happen? And for that, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Namrata, who will run you through this a bit more. Thank you, Raman. Can you hear me okay, everybody? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, it's really exciting to be talking to this particular room about internet shutdowns, because there are few other rooms that have such collective and comprehensive insight into the power of the internet and how it can be unleashed to protect the rights of the people. So this is really exciting for me and I hope that it leads to more conversations between us and everybody here. So thanks for being here. On shutdown specifically, as Raman mentioned, Keep It On campaign, uh, which is run by Access Now, but is a coalition of several organizations globally, is one of the campaigns that we are likely most known for. and definitely one of our greater priorities um, through this year as we go through so many elections. Now, internet shutdowns are defined differently by a lot of groups. Just to clarify, the way we look at it is any intentional disruption of the internet or any electronic communication service, which means that not just blanket internet outages, but also specific bans like the TikTok ban that we're seeing in so many countries, that is very much what we would consider as a shutdown. Um, in terms of how they are imposed, quick question to everybody here, if you could just raise your hand. How many people here could go without the internet for six months? None. Um, how many could go without the internet for two weeks? Two, three. Impressive. And how many could go without it for two days? More of you, maybe about like 10 or so. Okay, great. So just to explain to you the duration um, for which people around the world have had to go without the internet, and these are just some examples. In Tigray, Ethiopia, people had a communication blackout for more than 700 days. In Myanmar, it was for more than 500 days. And in Manipur, in India, most recently, for more than 200 days. That's how long people have not had the internet. And there are also throttling efforts. So for example, even when the internet is reinstated for a very temporary period, people only have access to 2G. That has tremendous impacts on rights, right? Which I'll come to when everybody here is very familiar with. But just in terms of the more recent trends that we've been seeing around how these internet shutdowns are imposed, they are becoming more proactive instead of just reactive. Earlier, what we used to see is if there was a quote unquote law and order situation, an internet shutdown would follow. But what we're seeing now is if a new policy is going to come out and if there are protests announced around it beforehand and these are peaceful protests, the internet is shut down proactively for the next two or three days um, just to stifle dissent, just to stifle protest. So that's one of the trends we're seeing. They're also becoming more sophisticated in how targeted they are. They target very, very small regions, small districts, as opposed to entire states and cities. The reason I mention this is that it has an impact on reporting. It means that all the large numbers that you will see, can we change the slide, please? Thanks. All the numbers that you see around shutdowns, 
they don't capture the entirety of the problem. There are lots of shutdowns that go unnoticed, either because they are for a very short duration or they are very, very targeted to a particular location. And the media or, or actors like everybody in this room, we've not got news of it. So that's just to say that, that this is only a sort of small view into the wider problem. To explain how this has grown, right? Uh, we've been tracking this since at least 2016 when 25 countries imposed 75 shutdowns. And in 2022, it was raised to 35 countries and 187 shutdowns. These are just the documented shutdowns, again. So increasingly, we're seeing internet shutdowns being weaponized as a tool for censorship and as a very clear sign of digital authoritarianism. To go over the impact on people, right? Uh, when there is a communication blackout, when the internet is shut down, and often it is just mobile internet and not broadband, which in itself contributes to the digital divide, right? In most regions, more people have access to mobile internet than to broadband, because broadband is cost intensive, resource intensive, and largely institutions would be able to kind of have access to that kind of connectivity. That means that people cannot communicate freely, often in the middle of crisis. People cannot check on their loved ones um, if they're doing all right. They cannot access information that might get them to safety. And amid the rampant generative AI and fueled by other mechanisms, the disinformation that we're seeing in the mega election year also, people cannot verify the authenticity of information. So it has tremendous impacts on people's basic human rights. It also has an impact on journalists' ability to report. We have seen internet shutdowns serve as a cloak for the violence that's taking place on the ground, uh, because reports about it don't come out. And that means that journalists and others are not able to hold authorities and people to account. It also has an impact on livelihoods. I think since the pandemic, we've all seen that our lives online, the shift to living online has kind of been accelerated and expedited. We do more things online than we ever did before. A lot of people depend on it for education, for healthcare, for essential services. And when there is throttling, when you have slow internet or no internet, you cannot access these services. Um, a lot of professions depend on it. Gig workers, for example, uh, you'll see that in one of the stories um, on the slide. Gig workers cannot take orders, process payments, and therefore cannot earn their daily wages and livelihoods when there's no internet. So that's just a brief overview of the kind of, and not, by no means exhaustive, of the kind of impact it has on people in their daily lives. There's also a macro level impact, which is sometimes a little more um, interesting uh, for the governments to listen to. But of course, it's certainly not the focus of what we are trying to highlight. It does have an economic impact. And just some of the figures, um, in India, just in the first half of last year, the cost of internet shutdowns was 1.9 US dollars, 1.9 billion US dollars. And in Africa, there is a study that says that a 10% increase in mobile internet device penetration is responsible for a 2% increase in GDP per capita. So that's the kind of micro and macro level economic impact that shutdowns have. Now, what are we doing about it? These are all the problems that we are seeing, and they're only growing every day. Um, one of the things that we do is domestic and international coalition building, and that is what the Keep It On Coalition is. We are a coalition of 105 organize, uh, sorry, 300 or more organizations from 105 different countries. These organizations work together to track, monitor, and fight against internet shutdowns. And they comprise of a variety of stakeholders. So it is digital rights organizations, human rights defenders, journalists, media, civic tech communities, uh, academics, and so on. So that coalition is growing, and we hope will continue to grow. Um, happy to talk to anybody who's interested post um, this session. One of the initiatives of the Keep It On Coalition is Election Watch, where we work with our partners in various countries to identify the risks around elections. And we put, we put them on a sort of quote unquote watch list. The screenshot that you see on the screen is just a small extract of it. Um, we, look, we work before, during, and after elections to put pressure on governments to maintain connectivity, um, not just through the elections, but also before and after. We see some 
small wins where in Bangladesh, for example, the government publicly committed to keeping it on. Uh, this was by no means a result of just our work. It was a collaborative effort with a lot of organizations around the world and especially in Bangladesh. Uh, but equally, there are governments where we don't see positive responses just yet and which remind us that we need to keep kind of uh, fueling this fight further and joining hands. More examples are on the screen again. Um, Perhaps, again, some, one of the most well-known products coming from Access Now is the Keep It On report, which is an annual report that we publish around how we have, uh, around the various shutdowns that our partners and we have tracked around the globe. It has regional snapshots. It has the trends that we are seeing over the years. Um, we look at the orders that authorities have passed to impose these shutdowns, and then we look at what the reason they have stated is versus what we think the real reason was, just to give a sense of the political realities of a particular place, how governments are borrowing from each other in terms of using this as a sort of low-hanging fruit um, that is really damaging to human rights. These are some of the advocacy, well, things in our toolkit. We spoke about the coalition building. Uh, legal challenges also play a big role. Um, access now, again, with local, local partners in different regions, we approach courts to challenge orders imposing communication blackouts or um, internet shutdowns. In some cases, partners have seen some wins. Um, in Africa, for example, there has been uh, jurisprudence developing around how shutdowns in specific contexts are unlawful. In India, it's a bit of a mixed bag. We've seen recognition of the right to connectivity as an important component of the fundamental rights under the Constitution, um, and also around pressurizing governments to at least make public the orders so that they can be challenged and scrutinized. But the challenge here is translating all that legal jurisprudence into concrete action by the government. So there's still a long way to go, uh, with the ultimate goal being legislative changes right at the bottom. Uh, because ultimately, a framework that allows the authorities to shut down the internet is, we believe, violative of human rights. So the change has to eventually go there. Um, international advocacy, media awareness, um, I think it's I'd like to talk a little more about the technical community bit, um, just what, how the technical community has helped us in this fight. And um, digital security helpline is a big one. Access Now has a 24-7 digital security helpline that Raman briefly spoke about, um, where we provide guidance. And also, this includes things like circumvention tools. If we anticipate that the internet is likely to be shut down, or if somebody from the civil society, activists, human rights defenders reach out with guidance on how to access the internet in the middle of a shutdown, we provide help to the extent we can with resources that can be used. That includes things like using VPNs, um, using proxies like WhatsApp recently announced, uh, so that access can be maintained in the middle of such orders. Um, there's a lot more that can still be done. There are, especially with the measurement community, because like I said, some of the problems are around being able to track these shutdowns. Um, there are some examples. There's Uni, there's IODA, where they measure network traffic, where they allow users to test whether specific web websites and apps are working, and then public dashboards are maintained so that people know um, where there is a shutdown and can then be amplified internationally. So there's certainly more that can be done there. Um, equally around, there are other causes, right? Government orders are just one. We've seen in Taiwan that there are threats of outages um, in specific regions, given the cable cuts, um, connections to mainland China, et cetera. So there's around monitoring those things, both from a technical perspective and analyzing where shutdowns become a lever in political standoffs. Uh, there's certainly a lot of work that we think policy and technical communities could do together. Um, and I think this is a great space to start talking about that. So once again, thank you so much for the opportunity. And we're here for any questions, follow-ups, and very much looking forward to conversing with all of you about it. Thank you. Um, I'll hand it over to Michael to talk about our work on spyware and surveillance and Just tech. a reminder in between, as and if you have questions, don't wait till the end. Please go on to the Slido and feel free to start adding questions there. The QR code is there, there, reminder there. So please do. And because we know that sometimes immediately a question might come or you might have a comment, don't wait, don't worry. Of course, if you want to write it down, that's totally fine. But you can go ahead and add it to Slido there again. 
Thanks for that reminder, Ramon. Um, just as a uh, reiteration, my name is Michael Dedora. I'm the U.S. Policy and Advocacy Manager at Access Now. I'm truly grateful to be here uh, with this, this crowd of activists and also with uh, my colleagues who are intelligent and bright and caring and also have reminded me that I have a little bit of work to do to up my blazer game. Um, so. Uh, We'll be working on that at, at the next before the next event. Um, just to pick on uh, pick up on one of the things that Namrata mentioned about the impact of internet shutdowns on journalists. Um, before Access Now, I worked at the Committee to Protect Journalists, and I was leading all their engagement with uh, the U.S. government on freedom of the press around the world. And the, really, the main uh, reason that I ended up coming to Access Now almost two years ago is because I was seeing on the front lines, speaking with journalists, the impact that technology was having on their ability to do their work, while it was enabling them to do better journalism than before. Governments uh, and nefarious actors were also using technology in ways in which it made it really unsafe for those journalists to do essential work, um, if not impossible, you know, for example, through, through internet shutdowns. Um, so it really opened my eyes over the last couple of years to, to the threats that, that technology can, can pose um, to human rights. What I am going to speak about a little bit is the work that Access Now is doing on surveillance technologies and spyware, and I'm going to talk about it broadly, but also from uh, a bit of a more narrow perspective about what we're doing in the United States. Um, Okay. Surveillance technologies are often used and justified by governments for national security, uh, protecting, protecting law and order. Um, and unfortunately, what we have found and many other organizations have found is that these surveillance technologies can also be quite dangerous and sometimes more dangerous than the problems that they're intended to solve. Um, Access Now has led for the last several years, a coalition of organizations around the world that are seeking to ban biometric recognition technologies and other technologies that enable mass and discriminatory surveillance. And I think that's a, a really key piece of the terminology here is that when entities are engaged in mass surveillance, it is extraordinarily difficult for those surveillance systems to not be discriminatory. Um, within the context of the United States, unfortunately, there are uh, quite a few issues with mass surveillance uh, programs, authorities, and, and technologies. Um, for example, the Biden administration just signed into law of reauthorization of uh, the FISA 702, uh, which allows the federal government to monitor communications and access communications of individuals, supposedly only individuals outside the United States. Not that that is a good thing. Um, but what's been shown is that this program has been abused over and over again to access the communications of Americans. Um, and so Access Now has been on the front lines working with coalition partners to try to end that program. Um, but unfortunately, we're up against quite a wall when it comes to uh, U.S. support for mass surveillance. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit why I find that so hypocritical, um, but it's worth, it's worth mentioning. The more um, specific piece of the surveillance work that we do is on targeted surveillance, and that is on really specific to spyware technology. Um, and what we've seen over the last couple of years is report after report by organizations that we work with, like Citizen Lab and Amnesty International, um, that have shown that human rights activists, lawyers, journalists, even uh, opposition politicians have been targeted with various forms of spyware technology, some of which are so advanced that you would have no idea that it's on your phone and the individual on the other side or the entity on the other side would actually have full access to your phone. So whatever context you have in there, whatever text messages you're sending, emails, um, some of the spyware technologies even allow the individuals or entities targeting you to activate your phone, your, your video and audio, um, so they could be real-time monitoring you without you having any idea that this is happening. 
there's a host of rights that all of these surveillance technologies impinge upon. I think foundationally the right to privacy, the right to protect you know, yourself and your person um, is a really important one. And that also implicates uh, data protection because all of these surveillance programs, uh, particularly the mass surveillance programs, are collecting massive amounts of data on individuals. How are those governments collecting that data? Where is it going? Who is it being shared by? How long is it being stored? How secure is that storage? Um, are questions that we're constantly asking uh, of governments at Access Now. But there are plenty of other rights, I think, that are, that are implicated here. Um, certainly freedom of expression, your right to uh, express yourself, to, to engage uh, with the world, and relatedly freedom of association, your right to associate with individuals and organizations that you want to associate with and to act that out publicly, um, to think that in the space of doing that, that you could be surveilled or directly spied upon on your electronic devices, I think is truly a disturbing thing. And, and Namrata and, and Rahman and others have already spoken to, I think, you know, the psychological and practical impact of that. So Access Now has been working on the wrongful use of surveillance and spyware technologies in a number of different ways, some of which have already been discussed. I really do think it's, it's critical to highlight the work of our uh, 24 seven digital security helpline. Um, that is really on the front line of helping individuals who think that they have any kind of spyware technology on their phone to get support from our helpline, um, to get individuals who can help them escalate their cases or do forensic research on their devices to understand what is actually going on. Um, and so that helpline is working directly with with, with tech platforms as well as on the other side with the activists who are on the ground and think that, you know, again, that they've been unfairly targeted. The helpline also works with our legal team to do investigations, uh, as well as with our regional teams, um, to understand the use and impact of spyware technology around the world. And we've published various investigations into the use of, I think most recently, spyware technology in Jordan, as well as in the Azerbaijan-Armenia conflict, which is the first time that we've documented the use of spyware amidst armed conflict. And then there's also legal advocacy that we're doing that is related to, the, to that, that line of work. Um, whether it's joining or supporting uh, lawsuits that organizations are bringing to try to bring these spyware companies to justice for the abuses that they've caused. And then, and this is kind of where I come in a bit more, uh, we're engaged in a wide range of advocacy and policy work now these, these efforts that we're engaged in are primarily regionally led, and that feeds back into what Ramon was talking about at the start, that as an organization, we're grassroots to global. We want to understand what the problem is as locally as possible, the impact on activists and human rights defenders locally, and then bring that up to that, that global scale and talk with global and international policymakers. So regional teams are all working to different extents on you know, what they consider to be the spyware problem in their region. And there are regions, of course, where spyware is less of a problem or is less impactful than in other regions. Um, but Access Now has also dedicated international staff and international resources to addressing um, the problem of spyware. And so those staff work in tandem with our regional staff to, again, kind of scale up that grassroots to global um, framework. In the United States, in the context of the United States, um, it's been something that has been a tremendous focus for Access Now for at least three or four years, certainly the entire time that I've been at the organization. And in fact, I, when I was at the Committee to Protect Journalists, worked with Access Now um, on spyware, particular to, to its impact on, on press freedom. Um, but there are a number of things that we're doing in the United States or that we've done in the United States over the last couple of years that have been really impactful. Um, first, uh, coordination has been really important for us. So twice a year, Access Now brings together civil society organizations as well as US government officials from Congress and the administration and has private closed door meetings about the nature of spyware, spyware research, and the things that governments need to be doing, particularly the US government needs to be doing um, to respond to the spyware problem. And this has been really impactful because there's just a lot of stuff that government officials will say in private rooms that they will not say in public forums like this that can be really helpful for us as activists to understand where we should be pointing our efforts. 
Um, so this has been a really important thing for us. And I should also note that a lot of this spyware work has went on under the Trump administration, which unfortunately was an administration not particularly interested in tackling the use of spyware around the world. And so initially, a lot of the focus for Access Now was on US Congress, trying to use Congress as a body to ensure that spyware companies around the world that are, again, selling spyware in the free market to governments that are using it um, to, you know, to engage in human rights violations are being held accountable. Within Congress, we've had some real success. In 2021, we were able to um, get passed into law a bill that would require the State Department to submit to Congress every year a list of spyware companies that the U.S. government should not be doing business with. Now, it's a classified list, um, but it has been submitted to Congress every year, and it does inform the work that Congress is doing. Following up on that in 2022, we were able to get, um, and there are some links to uh, some of the posts that we've put up on this here, um, we were able to get even more stringent regulations put in place that mandated the U.S. intelligence community do reporting on the threat of spyware, um, particularly to U.S. national security. Um, also set a number of internal guidelines for intelligence community members and government officials in the U.S. for, the, for their electronic devices. Um, but most interestingly, it expanded the sanctions authority that the U.S. president has to hold spyware violators accountable, as well as, only, uh, as, well as giving the president authority to block former U.S. intelligence community members from going and working with other governments and helping them spy on human rights activists and defenders. And right now, we're in the midst of another huge push in, in uh, 2024 to try to get something enacted, and I'll touch on that in a moment. I should just note that the Biden administration has been far more active and really made this a key component of their foreign policy work. Um, to be active on, on the issue of spyware. And when the Biden administration came in, uh, we had made a number of recommendations to them over the years, many of which they've, they've taken on. So just a, a few that are really important. One, the Biden administration has consistently used something that is uh, called the entity list. It's a Department of Commerce list that effectively bars um, companies from doing business with the companies that are on the entity list. So it really restricts the ability of, of companies on the entity list to, to access U.S. technology and U.S. markets. In 2021, the administration placed two spyware companies, Kandaroo and NSO Group, probably the most infamous spyware group, um, on the entity list. And then in 2023, added several um, of a company called Intellexa, uh, several of their entities on the entity list. In addition to that, uh, the Biden administration recently created a visa sanctions program that allows the president to, play, to effectively bar from traveling to the United States individuals who are benefiting from or engaged in the spyware business that is enabling human rights violations. And one of the really interesting pieces about the scope of the visa sanctions program that they launched, and we were urging them to, to make this about as broad as they could, and inclusive as they could, is that it does also include immediate family members. So just to give you an example of why this matters, you might be a very wealthy individual in Greece who's involved with a spyware company as an executive, and you might want to send your kids to Harvard in the United States. But if you're now on this visa sanctions list, and it applies to your immediate family members, well, they're going to have a lot of trouble going to the university in the United States. So again, it's just ramping up the pressure on these companies to make it more and more difficult for them to operate and create a safer space um, around the world. Um, the effect that it's had on the spyware market, uh, no doubt, has been seen. Uh, particularly NSO Group, after it was added to the entity list, has essentially spent all of its time trying to get off this entity list. And there's been a lot of reporting about what is the impact of the entity list, and I think it just goes to show that if a company is spending all of its time trying to get off the list, that it probably does have some impact on the ability of that company to operate. Um, the one thing that I mentioned that we're engaging in in 2024 is um, another big piece of what the Biden administration has done on spyware, and that is that it barred federal use of, of spyware um, within the United States uh, through an executive order. The problem is that it's an executive order, so it's 
this particular president's wish that this be the policy of the United States, but the next president of the United States could decide that this is no longer going to be the policy of the United States and wipe it away. So what we're trying to do now is get Congress to write this into law, to make this statute so that the next president cannot come in and simply um, you know, get rid of these programs. And that's something that is a real challenge. And just to, to kind of get into to some of the, um, the challenges that we face, I think, uh, let me go back for a second. Um, you know, we have some real opportunities and real challenges that we're facing. Um, some of the challenges that we face are that the context in which we often discuss spyware and surveillance technology, unfortunately, with governments is often in the national security framework and not necessarily in the human rights or privacy framework. And that is something that we as an organization are constantly up against. The US government really cares about spyware primarily as a national security issue. What we're trying to convince them more and more and include more and more language in you know, bills and legislative legislation is that this is a threat to US foreign policy and it's also a threat to human rights globally. So this is not just something that the US should be concerned about from a national security perspective. Another challenge we face though is that even some of our allies are, how do I say, imperfect um, and quite sympathetic to the national security arguments. I mean, within the United States, again, the existence of mass surveillance programs, um, I think points to some hypocrisy at, at the federal level as to caring about trying to end certain forms of surveillance, but then also wanting to protect the right of the US government to engage in surveillance themselves. So, it's a real challenge that we're in, and part of that challenge is that it undermines the authority of the US government around the world to go and work with other governments and argue that it's important to end certain forms of surveillance when they can turn around and say, well, the US government's engaged in wide ranges of surveillance itself. Um, another big challenge is that this is necessarily a foreign policy problem. Um, we're talking about, you know, for example, an Israeli spyware company selling spyware to, I think, uh, the most recent reporting I was seeing this morning uh, from Amnesty is that Israeli um, spyware was sold in Indonesia. And so now the Indonesian government might be using that against Indonesian citizens, but they also might be using it against individuals who are in Indonesia who are not Indonesian citizens. And that implicates another government. Um, so you're talking about a very messy situation in which governments have to come together and try to figure out how to solve this problem. There's not kind of one person that the buck stops at. Um, and then I spoke you know, about the fragility of US leadership, and I think the upcoming election is certainly an example of how we would see two very different administrations approaching the issue of spyware. Um, but we're also dealing with things that are happening out in the real world. You know, the US, while it's trying to be a leader on spyware, is also at the same time right now, I think its credibility has been called into question by the situation uh, in Gaza and Israel's attacks on, on the population there. And that no doubt impacts the ability of the US to work on spyware because they're engaging with other governments who have very different views on the situation in Gaza. Um, that being said, there are also a lot of opportunities. And this is where I'll end kind of on a, on a high note because this can be a very uh, disturbing topic to, to talk about. First, I think that digital connectedness is leading to greater civil society cooperation around the world. This is absolutely happening for journalists. Um, but it's also happening for human rights activists, lawyers, um, human rights defenders. I've seen, and it's a bit more anecdotal than, than thorough research, but I've just seen increasingly my ability in the United States to be connected with spyware victims around the world, to bring their stories to, to the United States, to speak to US policymakers about them. I, I'm, it's much, much easier for me to do that now as an advocate in the United States as it was 10 years ago because of how technology has really changed. I mean, I can pipe a spyware victim into a room in Congress on Google Hangouts or Zoom from somewhere halfway across the world, and that testimony can really change the way in which the US government is approaching the spyware problem. So that's, that's big. Additionally, there is increasing cooperation among governments, and the one thing to know here is, is that at the first Summit for Democracy was launched a, a joint statement on countering the proliferation and, and misuse of, of commercial spyware technology. And at the most recent Summit for Democracy in South Korea, a number of governments were added to that statement. And I think there are now about 15 governments um, on that statement. And that's something that the US government and other governments are now trying to build out um, to, to 
basically build an, an allyship. And then the last thing I would note is that the issue is being understood, I think, more fully now by policymakers. I mean, first, I don't need to tell you that I mean, you could probably assume like most, the average age of members of Congress is fairly old. They don't understand technology that well. Um, and so we have to do a lot of explaining to them about what technology is. Well, we've kind of gotten over the hump a little bit and they're getting to the point where they understand some of the policy responses, but we're now actually getting past just the, what are some visa sanctions programs or economic things that we can do. The biggest piece of conversation that's happening right now in the U.S. government, and we are holding um, a private forum with the U.S. government in June on this with some partners, is how to tighten some of the pressure on the money flow. So how are these spyware companies getting all this money to operate? Who's investing in these spyware companies? Do these people even know how much money they have invested through various funds in spyware companies that are engaged in human rights violations? So we're now engaging with the investment community. We're engaging with other nonprofits that are engaging with the investment community. And we're engaging with US policymakers to try to ratchet up the pressure on investors. And some of that is just pure education. Um, but all of this together, working with at Access Now, our business and human rights team, working with our other regional teams, there's a tremendous amount of pressure that we bring uh, on governments and on investors. And I think there's been a lot of change in the last couple of years. And hopefully with some of these opportunities that, uh, that we have, there will be even more change in the next couple of years. I know that Ramon said hopefully in a couple of years we won't be here, there'll be new faces, but uh, I would actually love to come back here in a few years. So if you want to invite me back, I'll come. Thank you. And I will do, again, a reminder, because I know that is many people are very interested in spyware and specifically what do victims face, how does it work, how do the, some of these government responses work, how does the question of government hypocrisy and using their own so sovereign surveillance capabilities work with the action we are seeing against some of these very problematic glo private hack for hire firms. Slido, ask your questions, add them there, we will not forget. So just a reminder on that one. Um, I. We want to connect you a little bit to, to a couple of related areas. And one reason, of course, why we also work on the issue of spyware and elsewhere is, for us, it's been very core, and I know so core to many members of the GovZero community as well, is our sense of privacy when it comes to the digital age, and particularly around protecting our data. Uh, I think from the very beginning, Access Now has been very clear. And in some ways, I say we, we perhaps distinguish ourselves from the very first internet freedom groups who started, who are very often focused on online free speech, although that's a gross oversimplification, but we've seen that protecting your data is critical and having an ability to say that I have strong rights around personal privacy and around the protection of data is key to this. And there are different elements we do that. One, by trying to prevent overbroad government access to data, as Michael is like alluding to, and saying whether that's overbroad surveillance laws, surveillance practices, or spyware, where governments are using private sector vendors to bypass and attack your data. The other part of that, and sometimes can be boring, but as important, is strong data protection laws and enforcement of data protection frameworks, making sure they are regulators controlling access to not just what private companies do, but also what public sector bodies may do with your data. And for us, that's in fact been an interesting thing because as I said, we're a digital security organization and we know that this is all interconnected. Digital security, data protection, and cybersecurity more generally are all collect, are connected topics. They're often not connected enough or we think that they're very separate areas. Um, as Michael was also alluding to, one challenge we're seeing often on some of these conversations because it's all becoming about cybersecurity. If you mention Trump, you can't you know, mention cyber, right? And he once said, like, I know, I know I have, I'm very talented on the cyber. And every policymaker or every tech person used to like, laugh and say, oh, but I think that's actually quite telling because to policymakers, it's all now just cyber, hashtag cyber. That's what they think is important. But when you go beyond that, there's a lot of specific conversation. There is specific conversation around cybersecurity practices of companies and of government. Data protection and privacy laws also sometimes subsumed within cyber or cybersecurity. Not always a good thing, but again, let's talk about what that means. But also often cybersecurity is conflated with traditional national security. And that's not always improper. In fact, national security communities often have played roles on what's called information assurance. And again, Taiwan is an excellent space to talk about this because many people in your community or the tech space more generally are very aware of how you know, protection of systems does require sometimes understanding what the national security community may be seeing. But you want to make sure that you hold them to be a bit honest and you protect rights 
And that's what we, I think, very strongly believe in. And this is what a little bit of what we focus on at Access Now. We try to ensure that cyber security uh, laws and policies at the domestic and regional level are human rights respecting. We try to ensure that data protection laws exist in countries and are enforced by strong independent bodies. And that's a topic I hope to take up in Q&A, because I know many folks from Taiwan also have strong views and interests in that area. But also that these global conversations happening, whether in the United Nations or between member states or between big multilateral fora, that there, as you talk about global cyber norms and you have cyber diplomats meeting, that they actually ensure that these global cyber norms that are being discussed and advanced help, you know, respect uh, and are, indiv uh, sorry, help uh, anchored around individual centric approaches and of protecting human rights in particular. As I mentioned there, it comes from the fact that this isn't an empty space. We are at risk. One reason why we work on cybersecurity policy is because our uh, uh, chief technologist, Gustav, uh, who's been with the organization pretty much in the founding, he actually had a very important takeaway for us nearly six years ago. He says, um, there's an entire conversation, should we call it cybersecurity work or digital security work? And I, I don't want to go too deep into the weeds, but he said, no matter what, you have to engage on the topic. Because the reality is that cyberspace now is incredibly militarized in a way that no one has seen before. The sort of attacks and capabilities that, for example, nation states are using not just against each other, but against companies, individuals, NGOs, are incredibly sophisticated. For example, some of the references to spyware that Michael mentioned are, in a sense, the sort of like now uh, hacking for a service or like sort of democratization of these capabilities that now exist. But in addition to that, like every day we've been seeing more, more sophisticated attacks. What our helpline data I showed in the beginning talked a little bit about that, and I'll talk about that a bit further. And we are particularly worried that these cybersecurity conversations are not often enough anchored in terms of how are individuals and vulnerable communities impacted? How are the human rights groups who come and attend the Gulf Zero Summit or who, for example, many people here collaborate with across Southeast Asia or across other parts of East Asia, how are they impacted? That should be the focus of global cybersecurity policy conversations. And I think this is a bit cut off, but I can make sure you, you know, be able to read it. Our focus is that cybersecurity should be about protecting vulnerable individuals and communities, ensuring that there are systemic solutions that help secure networks and products and that allow us to exercise our human rights online. We believe that you can engage in cybersecurity policy while protecting and advancing a human rights approach. In fact, we think, and that's why the, our organization exists, you can't have human rights unless you have strong cybersecurity policy. You can't be an activist protesting and using your device to organize protests and hold your government to account if your device is compromised, if your networks are you know, insecure. You need access to the internet in the first place, and Namrata has noted that it can be taken away, but the other more surreptitious way governments take that right away is by attacking and compromising your devices. And it's not just governments, it's other bad actors as well. And as I've noted, there's a lot we need to learn about what you should not do, what you should avoid. And I think our region in particular, but also globally, there are many, many examples of what to avoid. And this is perhaps like an initial set of countries whose laws you should not be copying. And our view is this. You often do see the need for cyber crime laws at the national level to hold people to account. For example, as Michael mentioned, the groups such as NSO, they're actually being sued for hacking in US courts because what they did was hacking, criminal hacking. And you can see other examples of where people who are problematic actors, and again, in Taiwan and elsewhere in East Asia, we've seen examples, right? Sometimes with nation-state nation linkages around the intentional hacking and compromising of devices, sometimes for fraud. And I know the previous panel also talked about fraud in a Southeast Asian as well as East Asian context, but also sometimes for other, perhaps, you know, more problematic sovereign interests, although those might be uh, an issue. We're particularly concerned that in many countries of the world, including far too many in Asia, cybercrime laws are not about advancing cybersecurity or helping make you know, bad criminal actors be held to account. They're also cyber control laws. They are sometimes internet restriction laws. They are laws that actually give very overbroad powers to governments to define what might be an activity. So you might think compromising a device for uh, pur purpose of stealing data or stealing someone's, say, financial resources is a crime, whereas the government might say, well, compromising the value of information is also a crime, and when a journalist gets to find out that my system is actually, you know, not the most secure, that's compromising the information integrity of government systems. I'm not kidding. These are exact charge sheets we've seen filed by, you know, governments across the world. The Ecuadorian activist Ola Bini has been subject to a multi-year criminal prosecution because he used a simple network interface 
you know, system to just check and see what are the open ports on a government system, and he was prosecuted and for, uh, for the crime of hacking under Ecuadorian law. In this region itself, we've seen, for example, the Myanmar junta try to pass and then like through the backdoor pass and other ways, laws criminalizing the use of VPNs and other mechanisms like that. And that's why we say that when you're looking at the issue of cyber crime, it's very important for the human rights community to stand up and say, we're not opposed. In fact, we believe there should be laws that help hold criminal actors to account. But a cyber crime law should not be a cyber control law. It should not be an excuse to actually undermine protected human rights. And we do have suggestions of what people can do instead. And one part of that might be the passage of cyber crime laws or making sure bad laws don't pass. But the other simple active investment people need to make is to pass strong data protection laws. And we believe that it's very important for data protection laws to be anchored around the fact that privacy and data protection is a human right. Not, no system is perfect, but regulatory systems, you can have lessons learned. What you see on your screen a little bit, and we adapted this in multiple contexts, from 2018 onwards, we have provided do's and don'ts around how to pass data protection legislation. And based off the, our experience engaging in advocacy and the implementation of Europe's general data protection regulation, the GDPR, which many of you might be familiar, is in, in effect the world's gold standard when it comes to data protection. It's not perfect. It requires sometimes lessons learned, it's sometimes very specific to particularly the European context of how the EU works, because the EU is again, remember, not a nation state. The EU is a political arrangement between multiple states that then enforce matters at a domestic level with some regional supervision. But we have these recommendations there. And across the world, whether it's a complicated democracy like India, whether it's another complicated democracy like the United States or elsewhere, we are trying to advocate for strong federal level data protection laws and even further instruments there. Parts of those are simple things. Like when you create a data protection law, do you have an open conversation? Do you have an open stakeholder process in that? Do you draw everybody in? Do you ensure that data protection rights are sorry, that you provide individual data protection rights. It's not just about regulating data, it's about giving you a right of data portability. It's about giving you a right to access your data. It's about giving you a right to be able to seek the deletion of your data if it's out of date. Those are specific examples of what we want there. But also of having an independent data protection regulator. That when you create these rights, these rights should not ideally be administered by an agency in the executive branch, because in many countries in the world, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's Indonesia, whether it's India, whether it's United States, who is one of the largest collectors of data? The government itself. The public sector collects the most data. In fact, fun fact, uh, the first true data protection law in the world was passed by France, and it was passed by France because France was digitizing government databases. And because there was concern around how that data could be misused, the French government decided to ensure that there's a data protection law that applied to the public sector as well as the private sector. And that's, for example, the case in Europe. But in many other parts of the world, that's not always the case. There are also very good examples of what not to do. For example, India has passed a data protection law that exempts the public sector in many ways. We see similar problematic approaches in this region. You've seen enforcement of data protection laws that tends to favor the government, like the Hong Kong Privacy Information Privacy Commissioner, that tends to never really fine or punish the Hong Kong government, but tends to have very strong views on how activists, political parties, and companies may use data. And those are examples of what not to do. And I did want to leave here this particular thing, you know, thing for you, and I hope this can be taken up for more in Q&A. Taiwan has a particular important role to play today in 2024, into 2025 and later, when it comes to global leadership and also, of course, regional leadership on cybersecurity, data protection, and a human rights approach. And what I mean by that in particular is you've seen the threats of cyber attacks and how those can work, how also government powers can be misused. You come from a history of knowing how overbroad executive powers can be misused by government agencies, how you must be held accountable to courts and other rule of law instruments. But also, you have passed new laws that require enforcement. And this is like a hint. Please feel free to ask me about Taiwan's data protection law. I have views and about what must happen next, but that's for the Q&A later. I did want to end a little bit by talking about community and communities. And GovZero is all about community. And as we know, there are many interconnected communities, which is why this you know, summit is so powerful, why this community and the communities it connects to across Asia and the, and the world are so important. We hope we can play our small role in that ourselves. 
some of you may know of RightsCon. In fact, often more people know of RightsCon than they may know of Access Now. That's been a fun fact that our communication teams keeps telling us every year. The data shows it very clearly. More people know of RightsCon than Access Now. That's great because RightsCon is a community event. So it's not just about us, it's about you. RightsCon started off as a Silicon Valley human rights and technology conference. The idea being to have the tech sector, particularly at that point of time, the US tech sector, but we've gone far more global than then, be exposed to the reality of human rights globally. Not just to say the civil rights or political rights communities in the US, which are very important, but to be exposed to the international human rights community and what are people facing, whether in Geneva, in the Human Rights Council, or on the front lines in Tunis, in Sri Lanka, in Cambodia and elsewhere, to know what's going on there and to be able to hold them to account. That Silicon Valley Human Rights and Tech Conference has become much wider. It's become RightsCon, the annual tech and human rights summit. We rotate that across many regions in the world. This is when we held it in Tunis. Uh, and we were very glad to bring you to Tunisia because that's also where, in many ways, our security helpline started some of its first international work. And uh, when I joined the organization, RightsCon was just happening in Asia. It was in Southeast Asia, in the Philippines. I think we had 900 to 1,100 people participate. The year after that, that grew to around 1,900, then 2,000, and then in Toronto, 3,200. In Tunisia, 3,600. The pandemic happened. Uh, lives were changed. We thought there'll be drop off. We went to an online model, and online it jumped to 8,000 and then 9,000. And the last RightsCon, which is a hybrid event in Costa Rica, had 2,800 or so people in person. You can see the numbers there. Um, many more online to bring it to a grand total of around 9,000, 10,000 people participating. RightsCon is about digital rights in our age. It's about how digital has impacted every part of human rights, but it, that goes to not just classic issues like privacy, about cyber crime, cyber security, it goes towards the connection to the open data community, it goes to what are gig workers facing, it goes to the increasing issue of climate, human rights, and what sort of role do communities play. And why I'm mentioning all of this to you is we're very glad to bring RightsCon back to Asia. RightsCon will be happening next in February 2025 in East Asia, and we're very, very keen to make sure that members of the Gulf Zero community and broader can participate, can engage. The RightsCon call for proposals is open, you can submit uh, proposals there, and I would say we're not as good as Gov Zero, but like Gov Zero, we try to make sure we have an open call for proposals. So the programming is community-led. It's all about conversation. There are multiple parallel events happening, and why I really like it, besides the fact that we organizing it, is that it's lovely to sometimes see a meeting where you have a cyber ambassador and you have an activist who's literally been subjected to spyware attacks a few weeks ago, making sure to actually be there. You see tech sector companies looking a bit uncomfortable sometimes because they're getting asked hard questions being in the room there with journalists and others who want to hold them to account. And you even see activists, the next generation, people who are not comfortable with how traditional human rights advocacy has worked, or the priorities that sometimes you know previous generations, or you could say the West has had on human rights issues and digital issues, be raising hard questions about sovereignty, about control, about you know community approaches to data and more. And that's a space we welcome you to, and we hope you can participate. The call for proposals is open. It's open till June 5th. Please submit, and if you have questions, don't just reach out to us. Our colleague Reitz, who's not here, because if you go up that stair, through the door, there's the booth for Access Now on RightsCon. Uh, Reitz will be happy to help you with questions about RightsCon and its community. And I want to leave you with that. There's a lot to cover, and we've tried to cover a bit of that. We know this is an opening for conversation, and this is, in many ways, building on work that many of you and others are already doing. We welcome questions, and if we don't get to cover your question in this open Q&A right now, I just wanted to make sure you can contact us. Those are email IDs. I just wanted to again say thank you so much for patiently listening to us. We're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you for our friends from Access Now for a very thorough presentation from the Digital Helpline, from Internet Shutdown, Keep It On campaign, to the spyware situation, and then to RightsCon. And uh, to reiterate, RightsCon is happening February 2025 in East Asia, right? So, and the uh, call for proposal is on right now. If you're concerned with digital rights, please uh, consider to participate. I know I will be there. Um, okay, so I'm, sh I'm already seeing a lot of questions on the Slido, but I think we, for my personal interest, as uh, because I'm the moderator, um, I'm very interested in the digital helpline. Can you give some of the more e recent examples of what you're hearing in this region, in East Asia or Southeast Asia or South Asia, for that matter? Um, and who are the 
targeted uh, sort of victims that you're most concerned of? That's my first question. I can take an initial answer and see if anyone else comes in. Uh, perhaps like I'll step back. Um, one, of course, our helpline saw a massive uptake in requests during the pandemic, organic, right? Like it was clear that more people were using the internet and, tech and tech connected devices, so they'd be more under risk. What we particularly saw was explosion of activity during key political crisis moments. And I just want to note there, uh, lots of them, particularly uh, some periods in India around ma uh, mass mobilization and protest around key moments like the Citizenship Amendment Act and others, uh, a lot of activity, again, in Bangladesh, not always coming to our helpline, but coming to other actors as well, including people requesting help on forensics. And again, you can see a link as Bangladesh passed and started implementing its Digital Security Act, which is being used to target activists. We sort of saw those requests coming in. Uh, but the, what we also saw a lot was um, uh, especially around the coup in Myanmar and afterwards, and we had seen a pattern of this in Hong Kong earlier. As the coup happened, a lot of requests come in for activists who were trying to scrub their profiles online, be able to make sure that there wasn't presence available there, what, uh, what is going on. People tend to redact their presence to not come under threat. We'd also seen similar activity in Afghanistan, which has been more underserved by the digital security community globally and was harder. But there in particular, uh, Michael's previous organization and our collaborator, CPJ, do great work. So that's an example of that. But I think what I'll pretty note on is we are seeing uh, we are seeing a lot of community interest in the issue of spyware for sure. We have seen spyware activity happen in parts of the region. Some of it's publicly documented. For example, in Thailand and activity in India and elsewhere. Um, I would like lastly leave that we are seeing a lot of helpline requests come in teed to national election moments. And like you know, examples of that are Indonesia and elsewhere there, but that's a broad level. I will go back and I'm also happy to take some of this offline. We don't publish our helpline data in a granular way, partly because we clean it up to make sure that people are not under risk. Some of the mitigation steps we don't always explain fully publicly because if people know how to mitigate spyware, sometimes then they also know how to be able to hide that ax, but happy to take more offline. Just to add to that very briefly, one more thing that we're seeing recently is around disinformation. So. Um, of course, there's a need to be able to identify, target, label, or take down disinformation. But it's also being weaponized, interestingly, where people are reporting pages that might actually be for advocacy and community building um, against or on views that might not be favorable to those in power. And then those are being targeted as pages that are spreading disinformation and then being taken down. So that's a very um, new-ish dynamic that we're seeing around disinformation and what our helpline is being approached with. And one last thing I'll add to that, it reminded me, is doxing. So what we've also seen in particular, uh, Myanmar is a great example of that with others as well, but is a lot of doxing activity targeting activists, often not necessarily digital rights activists, but traditional activists protesting, say, against the Myanmar junta, especially women or communities of sometimes color, LGBTQI individuals, who are then being targeted by often mainstream linked actors using, say, Telegram channels or even Facebook you know, groups elsewhere to try and dox them, find, you know, put out information about where they live, you know, what their personal life might be, trying to like, generate attacks against them. But that sort of like link between online activity and attempted physical retribution is something we're seeing for sure. Myanmar's example of that. There are other protest examples of that in the region as well. To just add, doxing uh, might be more familiar as Rosso in Taiwan. So searching for your actual identity and linking that uh, and then trying to intimidate and for you to give up your work. OK, so we have limited time. I want to go to Slido because there's one question that I think allows us to step even more back. Um, one question says, I've heard people are discussing of if internet access or access to uh, uh, right to connectivity should be a basic human right. I would like to get some insights on why or why not it is considered a necessity. That's, that's a great question and something that um, we have discussed. Um, I think right now it's important to think of the internet or the right to connectivity as an enabler of basic human rights, rights that we already have. And there's a certain strategic advantage to that in that those rights are contained and enshrined within 
domestic constitutions, international human rights frameworks, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and by that I mean rights like the freedom, right to freedom of information, right to assembly, right to information, right to privacy, so many of those rights. Um, it's right to connectivity is an essential component of all of these. So I think it is even um, strategically advantageous and accurate both to say that we already have this right. It's just about allowing us to exercise it without governments misusing the power um, they have over the infrastructure that um, enables us, us to stay connected as opposed to framing it as a new right where we might have to in many ways start from scratch. And that again, the framing becomes a little tricky the moment we ask for a right that is tech specific because the technology will evolve. So what exactly we mean by the right to be connected to the internet or the right to connectivity, we will be rehashing the same debate over and over again. So it might be better to kind of focus on the human and rights element of it and see where that fits in um, instead of trying to find a new one. But that's just our initial thinking around it and I'm very happy to hear different views. The only thing I just wanted to add, because Namrata covered that excellently, is just to note that our view is that any internet shutdown is not acceptable, is unjustified. I think it's very important because sometimes there's that tension, and I would note particularly in this region, that we've seen very useful and interesting conversations with our partners and colleagues in particularly India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and a few other places, um, you know, about are there exceptions, you know, or is it like a case like, you know, you can't tell the government there's no chance of a shutdown because we do have derogation of rights in certain cases. But our view is that there is no human justified situation under international human rights law where an intent shutdown is justified. Our view is every intent shutdown, especially an intentional disruption of internet access done by a government, is arguably not permitted by international human rights law. We believe this is the position that needs to be held true to. And that this also position is very important to hold to because otherwise the derogations become very, very easy. But that also goes to what Namta is saying that when you try to create a new right, when you create a new thing, then you start creating the new exceptions. And that's concerning. And there are many other co colleagues, including some in the room, who can speak to the fact that human rights law has already understood situations where you can exempt it. Like I always like how when a politician says, you know, even human rights have limits. I said, yeah, of course human rights have limits. They're all written down. Do you know those limits? Maybe not. But a judge does. And ask a judge that. Add that I think this becomes most acutely obvious in humanitarian crises. You know, the, for example, the beginning of the crisis in Gaza, we were advocating with the U.S. government, um, and you know we've seen internet shutdowns in Gaza, both from the destruction of telecoms, communication uh, infrastructure, but also. I think proactively the Israeli government flipping switches. And in policy conversations, you're talking with humanitarian um, people who are focused on humanitarian policy and the humanitarian response. And you know, we're, part of it was trying to improve telecommunications infrastructure, fix telecommunications infrastructure. But as we're having all these conversations about the humanitarian response, you know, our point was to the US government, how can there be any coordination on the ground of a humanitarian response if the internet is shut down? The way that people get information about how to access clean water and food, how to get to the safe hospital, how to get to, they, they get that through the internet. So just underscoring Namrata's point that the internet access is, is an enabler of all of these other rights. And I think it becomes really acutely obvious in humanitarian situations where if individuals cannot access information safely on the internet, it's a matter of life and death for them. Thank you, Michael. Just a spoiler, the next session in this room is, will be about um, concrete examples and sort of potential solutions in terms of internet shutdown. So please stay if you are interested in this topic. Uh, because in the interest of time, I want to jump to the next question on Slido and sort of bring it home, so to speak. Um, it says, does Access Now work with activists or journalists in China, and can GovZero or Taiwan help? I kind of want to bring it back to the greater sort of 
conversation and also echoes the th one of the themes of this summit is how can open communities like GovZero or RightsCon, you know, uh, deal with or try to uh, help in countering digital authoritarianism, not just from governments, but also from tech. I'll leave the final one minute and 15 seconds to you. Uh, maybe a quick answer. Um, uh, firstly, uh, on the first part of the question, uh, talk to me outside the room, happy to chat. Uh, the related part to that is that there is, exist networks and communities, and I think this like hints to why you know, I'm mentioning this. The digital security communities are open. They use open source platforms and host documentation on you know, GitHub, GitLab, many other places. They follow those protocols, but they also note, right? And many of the cybersecurity community more generally knows this, that you have to be open, but also follow networks of trust. And that's what digital security networks do. So for example, even to use a helpline, anyone can contact us. We do not service everyone which means that everyone goes through vetting. So we can talk a bit about that, but we encourage people in particular who are interested on digital security help, whether it's on mainland issues or more generally, to go to a uh, civicert, C-I-V-I-C-E-R-T dot O-R-G. That's the Civil, Civil Society Computer Emergency Response Team Network. It's something our helpline set up, working with many other helplines, including some of the folks that people may know in the room or the more high-profile ones, but many others too including some in this region. But more generally, what we like note there is that you do need networks of trust and security to know what's going on. And we're also happy to share what works with platforms. So as you noted, right, tech can also be, and in fact, the tech companies are a challenge. They are sometimes the adversary, but there's also the reality that people use them. There are platforms of escalation that work for them that don't work. And it's also important to know which platforms are sometimes actually true to their word, which aren't, and who might be offering help but are actually untrustworthy. These networks exist and can help. But again, that's why we hope that RightsCon and our work and the work of other digital rights communities can make sure that tech is accountable and also where we know how to secure ourselves, including the people who do may use mainstream tech platforms every day, because we know that reality. We may be more careful, but there are many more people who aren't always or may not have options. And there you need to make sure that through policy, tech platforms are held accountable, and through digital security practices, even if they're not fully accountable, you secure your data and your networks as best as you can. I'm conscious of time, but I do want to take advantage of being in the middle of such talent in terms of civic tech. And to your point about challenging platforms and the authoritarianism that we see from there. This is an ask. I think one challenge that we're definitely seeing is the perpetuation of a particular model of tech, right? These platforms um, run on surveillance, run on profiting out, out of harvesting your data, collecting it, sharing it. And that model has become the norm, but that doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. And there are lots of talented people working on tech that presents an alternate model. And I think a lot of people in the GovZero community could potentially kind of look at how alternatives could be presented to show that there are other rights respecting ways um, to do things. So I think that's definitely one proactive way to kind of combat it. No, and, and thank you just to also say, I know that we haven't answered every question, but we do want to catch the next session in the room. Otherwise, do catch us outside. Whenever you can, we're happy to try and answer the question, because at least these three excellent questions that we can take outside. OK, please join me in thanking our three excellent speakers. Thank you very much.